Hello and welcome. We have a very important show for you tonight. I'm glad you're with me. I'm going to be talking with Jean Waginius. She is a legislator in Minnesota from District 63B. She's been with the Minnesota legislature since 1986, I believe. That's right. So 30 some years, which is, you've got to be one of the uh, persons with the longest tenure, Jean. Yes. Yes. We're here tonight with Jean to talk about your passion for the environment. And I'm so excited to be able to learn from her and pick her brain. And we've got lots of topics that are what I think you all will agree are hot topics right now. We're going to discuss some in more depth, some in kind of a fast paced way since we don't have more than 30 minutes. But I wanted to ask first, Jean, how you got so interested in the environment that you've dedicated a big hunk of your career to environmental issues? That is a hard question to answer because I can't think of a time when I wasn't an environmentalist. So even way back in grade school and junior high, you well, had an interest? I just, I've always been interested in biology. Mm -hmm. And I have a son who became a biologist, so. So the, the family tradition carries on, yes. doesn't it? Um, well, you also were an attorney with the State Court of Appeals. Yes. So you got your law degree where? At William Mitchell. Oh, okay. Um, that's right, I had read that. And that's got to have been helpful as you delve into the environmental issues I mean, there seems to be such a lot of legal um, connection to almost every environmental issue. I was a staff attorney for the Minnesota Court of Appeals right after I graduated from law school. And it was that experience uh, that helped me understand how to write statutes. Mm -hmm. Which isn't something that would come naturally to one, would it? No. No, <laughs> I'm would sure not. not. Well, we're going to tackle about four big issues and then see how many more we can uh, cover. The, Min the Mississippi River, I want to talk about that first. It's our main source of water. And this is a true false statement. I want you folks to think about it. No state agency routinely tests specifically for drinking water. True or false? And the answer, Jean? It's true. It's true, and when I read that, I was so shocked, really. So we're not testing our Mississippi River water. Not as a source water. The, the, the drinking water that uh, folks in Minneapolis or St. Paul will drink has been tested after the fact, but not coming into the system. So what worries you about that? Well, first of all, you cannot, uh, business schools will tell you, you can't uh, manage what you don't measure. And mm -hmm. in this case, the Department of Health neither measures nor manages a drinking water source. So I think that is a major problem uh, for those of us who drink the river water. And, and it's about a million Minnesotans, not all in Minneapolis, but Minneapolis, St. Paul, and some of the suburbs. Uh, if there are additional pollutants coming into the river, and there are, then we have to clean them up, or the city of Minneapolis does, or the city of St. Paul. Minneapolis has an amazing drinking water plant, but to the extent they have to do more, it costs us more. And there's, a, sure. there's some unfairness there because... Uh, you mean the, it costs Minneapolis more. residents more than it would people downstream? Well, we, pay, we have some of the highest priced water in the state mm, Okay. because of the need to clean it up. And as I've understood things, the Republicans have been blocking the bill to do more in this regard with the source aspect. Well, I have uh, introduced two source water protection bills. Uh, and I wouldn't say they're necessarily blocking this bill because what they've been doing is just rolling back regulations where they can. And so this is going forward, so it, it's not even on their radar screen. Oh, I see. Um, do you anticipate there will be resistance, though, when it 
gets on the radar screen? Oh, it, most definitely, because one of the issues that we have is that, and one of my concerns, is that the Crow River uh, comes into the Mississippi about 20 miles north of our water intakes, and the Crow will drain much of middle Minnesota, and that's farm country. Yes, so a lot of pesticides. A lot of nitrates, a lot of uh, pesticides, and just recently, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency did some spot checking, random checking, mm -hmm. of uh, pharmaceuticals in our water mm -hmm. and found that the crow was high in pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. So it's nitrogen, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, all coming into our drinking water source about 20 miles north of where we take mm -hmm. it in. And that's a fact we don't, we don't read much about, we don't hear much about. I'm sure biologists and, and um, you know, a large group of people that are in this field do know about it, but the general public, I don't think we know about it. No. So what do we need to do as citizens when we hear this? What, what can I do? What can other people do who are thinking, no, this does not sound healthy? Well, I think having, just discussing it. Talking is, about it. Talking about it is the most important thing right now for people to understand. Uh, because you can't problem solve until you understand what the whole problem is right, about. Right. And so having people talk about it is great. Because we are not just having problems in the Mississippi. Mankato's having drinking water problems. There are private wells that are having real drinking water problems. Up in the Central Sands region of Minnesota, there are drinking water problems. It's not the same all across the state, but there are hot spots. And I'm sure the Minnesota River has got to be having problems because they get a lot of the agricultural runoff. Well, I mentioned Mankato. So what's going on in Mankato is there are, they get their water from shallow wells, but the Minnesota River and the Blue Earth River are both heavily contaminated, and they are now polluting those shallow wells. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what does Mankato do? And they have come to the state, and they have asked for help. Mm -hmm. And they're asking for money from the state. And I am very sympathetic to Mankato, because they did not cause the problem. Right. So the question <laughs> is, how do we help Mankato? Is it our taxpayers mm -hmm. helping Mankato? Or do we look to the source of the problem, which would be the uh, agricultural chemical industry, uh, which is probably the group that's making the profit from uh, these chemicals, and ask them to participate in helping Mankato. Is there any um, pattern for them, the chemical companies, being forced to or being willing to help in other states? Is there a precedent? I don't know of a precedent like that, but I, I can tell you that the state of New York, or the city of New York, gets its water way upstream, and they have an amazing protection system for their drinking water. So mm -hmm. there are places uh, that do it right. That we can look to and we learn can, from. Yes, yes. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's there are models good. out there. Um, and Bancroft has been on, and her whole focus now for her next hunk of her life is on water, and mm -hmm. it's something we need to start learning and talking about. Um, is there some reason the state of Minnesota's health department has been dragging their heels on this? I, I, I don't think anybody wants to stand up <laughs> to the, the big agricultural mm -hmm. companies. So I can give you an example of um, Atrazine is a farm chemical. Say it again, Jean. Atrazine. Oh, yes, okay. It's a farm chemical that was first regulated in 1992. And we still have the same standard for atrazine in our drinking water that we had in 1992, even though now we know that it's an endocrine disruptor. Mm. And we. So, in spite of knowing that. Yes. and to, then to add to that, you have to test the breakdown products of something like atrazine 
and our Department of Health does not test the breakdown products. So we, we don't have a standard for the breakdown products, just the parent. But a breakdown can be just as toxic or more toxic than the parent. And of course, they're additive. So health department has been behind the curve. Well, that's important to know, too. Um, would you think that letters, calls, emails to the health department, now we have a new commissioner, Jan, Malcolm, yes. Yes. Um, might get good attention or at least make I, people aware? I think that would be good. I remember once I learned from a statistician that one letter represents at least a hundred voices, yeah. or one phone call even. Mm -hmm. So that's something I, we can if do. If I remember correctly, Jan Malcolm was um, at the head of the Department of Health when we did a child-based standard instead of an adult-based standard mm -hmm. for air and water. And so she should be well aware that yes. that that came into being when she was there has not well, been that's implemented. That's hopeful, isn't it? Yes. Because that's another issue I have on my list to ask you about. You mentioned, you know, the problem in Mankato. Brown County, which is not far from Mankato, mm -hmm. um, down by, um, well, let's see, St. James would be Brown County, right? That I don't know. I think so. There's a, a issue there with the county saying we don't want to do well testing. Right. And just give us a little bit of the background on that. Well, this isn't asking the county to do well <laughs> testing. The Department of Agriculture has money from the uh, fund, the three-eighths of a cent sales tax. So they have money where they've been well testing across the state where they think the groundwater is vulnerable. And in addition to being vulnerable, uh, there are row crops in the area. So they've been testing for, oh, I would say at least three or four years uh, in various parts of the state. And so it's not money. The money is coming from the three-eighths of a cent sales tax, and it is the Department of Agriculture that does the work. Um, but what I hear from the Brown County folks is they're saying, well, um, we don't want folks to, we don't want the wells tested because then farmers will be blamed. And I don't think farmers are the ones that are gonna be blamed. It, uh, their farmers use the chemicals, but it's the uh, agriculture chemical industry that's actually making the money, not the farmers from, from this. So you think we, we better get those wells tested? Well, there are comp some townships in Brown County that apparently are vulnerable. And that's, um, I think if I were a mom or a dad in that county, I would say, well, what's going on here? Right. And start really yelling and shouting about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you wrote a letter to Governor Dayton back in November, mm -hmm. and you quoted the um, Academy, National Academy of Science with a very, very scary quote from them. And they have said and written that there is a one in 20 chance that human caused climate change will have an impact that is quote, beyond catastrophic uh, by the end of this century. And you pointed that out to, to Governor Dayton and asked him to do some real pushing, maybe via executive order, yes. on um, gas house emissions. Yes. And you just told me earlier, you haven't heard from him. Well, he did do an executive order, mm -hmm. and uh, I was hoping for more, because we have more opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Minnesota. So this year, we are having uh, a bonding bill, and we haven't been as creative as we can. I mean, we look at some of our schools across the state, flat roofs, be great education for children to have solar on their roof. It would make the, uh, the school's cost for electricity less. So we need to do some more creative things like that. We need to do some electric school buses, mm -hmm. electric 
uh, metro transit buses. Uh, so there's far more than we, we can do that kind of works for everybody uh, that we're not doing yet. And by putting money into those kind of companies, it's a win-win, isn't it? I mean, in terms of the economy, too. Well, we actually manufacture buses in Minnesota. Oh, we do? In St. Cloud and uh, maybe Breckenridge. I don't know the other okay. place. So there's an opportunity to, it's a to do it right. A double opportunity, yes. Right? Interesting. Um, another big topic that I wanted to ask you about, and this is um, controversial, I think, and gets at people's real basic feelings about their lives and their eating, but it's about diet and how when we are so dependent as we are as a country on beef and poultry, we're really adding to the negative effect of, of human climate change mm -hmm. um, problems. Do you think as a representative in a state that is so um, agricultural, that there's any chance we can push for some laws that will change and make it more appealing and more understandable to people uh, to think more about becoming vegetarians? Well, I don't know that there are any laws that would work there, uh, but mm. I think uh, if people understood better um, that the livestock we raise is responsible for 14.5% of the greenhouse gases globally. 14.5%? Which is large. Globally. Do you mean the livestock in the U.S. that's rate? No, that's internationally. Oh, okay, all that, over. That would be internationally. But in Minnesota, we raise, we, we grow corn, soy, a lot of potatoes too, so we should talk about that. Uh, the corn and soy are not used to, this is field corn, we don't directly eat that. Right. It's used for processed food, uh, ethanol, and uh, feed for cows and pigs and the th things that we, we do eat. Mm -hmm. uh, so people are moving away from processed foods. You can just ask General Mills. Right, People right. are moving away from processed foods. And just recently, there was a study that re, uh, made a relationship, or said that there was a relationship between processed foods and cancer. So I think more people are going to be moving away from processed foods. Uh, so as we talk about it, I think people are going to be changing. Uh, mm -hmm. But go to the grocery store right now and look in the shelves and look in the freezer cases, mostly processed food. You know, I think it's so hard for people to, to understand, and I don't understand it exactly either, but it's the manure that causes the gas that is so negative for our world, right? I, I think it's all the nitrogen that is applied uh, on the farm that will give us nitrogen oxide and that is one of the most potent of the greenhouse gases. So that's... So it's not just coming from the manure. No. But it's, it's coming from all the things that are needed to make the farm run, right? Right, right, right. Growing the corn with a lot of nitrogen and one of the consequences is some of it's going up in the air. So there's an air issue and then there's the water issue yes. because we're getting uh, this is where we're having problems with our drinking water, with nitrogen getting in our drinking water. And where there's nitrogen, there are going to be pesticides, and that's the Department of Agriculture's own studies will tell, tell us that. That's not what somebody is guessing. That is what our Department of Agriculture tells us. So by eating less meat, um, less red meat especially, we not only improve our own health, but the health of the planet. Right. And, and, the and our drinking water. Right, right, overall health. That's something we need to really all start paying more attention to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a big, big topic. Well, I want to ask you now, just we have about 10 minutes left, I want to ask you some of your off-the-top reactions to some of the other hot issues here in Minnesota. Um, 
the three and pollution question mm -hmm. and lawsuit that is uh, hitting us right now in our state. What's your take on that, Jean, just as a observer? Well, I don't have any inside knowledge. You're right about that. But it looks like we're just kind of a war of the experts. And we know that the Department of Health just came out with a study and said, eh, it's probably not much of a problem. And yet the Attorney General's office has also commissioned a study that said, yes, there is indeed a problem. So that's going to be a battle of the experts. And I would say that uh, the Attorney General may have a leg up here because our Department of Health has not had a good track record on uh, drinking water issues. Mm -hmm. And it's the PCs, the PFCs mm -hmm. that have been released into the groundwater, right? Right. Via the dumping of yes. waste from 3M. Yes. So it's it's not a it's not all over the state. No. It's, no. It's what area exactly? It's Washington County area. Just Washington County. That area. I don't know the exact boundaries. I'm guessing people living there are feeling quite anxious. Yeah. 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 Particularly if I, you know, for small children, that's where, where you'd be. Yes. Now, P PFCs are all over the world. They've gotten into our atmosphere, but, now, but what they're talking about is something very specific to Washington County area. And they're, okay. and they're drinking water. Well, we'll have to pay attention to this one. Um, um, Minnehaha Creek, you and I both live kind of close to that beautiful creek. Um, why is it important that we reduce the flow of water in that creek? Well, in my, in my South Minneapolis neighborhoods, I represent Lake Hiawatha and Lake Nokomis. Both of them have problems. And so in Lake Nokomis right now, the water is so high, it has just wiped out the beaches. But the groundwater is high, and so neighbors are, for the first time in anybody's memory, having water come up in basements, there's flooding in backyards, and as the city of Minneapolis is repairing uh, sewer pipes, having pump out water, which makes it much more expensive, uh, and it's costing us a lot of money. So that's happening, and then folks in Hiawatha, around Hiawatha, are worried about same thing, same kinds of things happening there. So the we don't know why it's happening. We don't have the science, and we don't have data. It looks like something changed in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so we're working with uh, the, the Department of Natural Resources and the Watershed District and the Park Board. And what is it that has changed that has made this happen? And one of the things people are talking about is there's so much water coming down the creek, uh, so much that the creek used to just almost run dry. It, Right. In, in the fall, but it was so high that it was almost over its banks in November of this last year. So that's one of the issues that folks are looking so at. We need to do more study and, and you can't, it, so take it, some action. Yes, so decisions were made without good science, mm -hmm. and now we have to have the good science. So kind of after the fact, maybe. Yes. Um, I'm getting a signal that we want to be sure to give viewers information so they can get a hold of you and learn more about what you're working on this year. As the legislative session starts tomorrow. Yes. We are taping on the 19th of February, 2018. So, Jean, your, uh, first of all, your website is www.jeanwaginius.org. Yes. And then tell us your blog, because you just told me that you do a lot of writing about your environmental bills via the blog. So it's blog.genewaginius.org. Uh, so the reason I write it is because um, the press just doesn't have the ability to ha cover what happens in the legislative committees. So I write about energy and the environment during the legislative process, and it's. That's what I do, and that's on my blog. So I don't write in the summertime. It's just during this session. Okay. Well, we will 
get that up on the screen. Um, I think we have time for two really just tight, tight questions. Um, salt and sand on our roadways and our sidewalks, what should we be using? I think people don't know that yet, but it has now risen to the top of, oh my gosh, we've got to do something about this because once the salt is in the lake, it doesn't go away. So, so we are, Ooh. people are concentrating on a way that wasn't there a couple of years ago. That's good. That is good, but it's too bad we didn't know this earlier. Right. I mean, look at all the years we've been putting sand on the highways. Well, we're out of time, Jean, but thank you so much well, thank you. for coming down on this okay. kind of bad weather. Oh, night. I know, it was bad. <laughs> but um, I really have learned a lot, and, and um, I hope you've enjoyed and also gotten maybe a little scared listening to her so that we can all get somewhat concerned together and, and uh, take some action on some of these things and support your good work. Oh, thank so you. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for being with us. I'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week. <laughs>